Hi, seniors. Okay. <clears throat> Look, um, again, to reiterate, technically, <clears throat> content will end, I guess, tomorrow with really a bad place to end, 1968. But I'll have a few follow-up, like, epilogue lectures tomorrow to try to, like, bring some closure to the class. But there won't be points associated with it. Okay, I don't even know how this is working with the attendance. You may still have to look at the pods. I don't know what's going on. But uh, I'll have pods next week. Mostly it'll be like <clears throat> trying to, you know, whatever, just whatever. I don't, but there's not going to be points, I don't think. The final grade, there's <clears throat> not going to be anything. There's, I'll use the, the papers. Again, I'm really sorry. I haven't gotten those graded yet. They'll be done oh, soon, I hope. And, but, and again, I'm not going to grade them hard. Don't worry. <clears throat> All right. So what are we doing? Oh, today. Okay, so today we're talking about the new left. Uh, this is really like the rise of radicalism, and it impacts a lot of what's going on with politics today because a lot of the, all the identity politics stuff that we deal with today, we would trace back to the years really <clears throat> 65 to 68, the development of this way of thinking, the development and the rise of radicalism <clears throat> in identity politics. And I didn't call it identity politics at the time, okay? But there was so, sort of two elements to it. The first is that on the one hand, you have the development of um, <clears throat> people identifying with groups that are marginalized. Um, so obviously, right, like <clears throat> uh, kind of the starting place for this was the civil rights movement. The inspiration for a lot of what the new left is uh, going to do is the civil rights movement. But the civil rights movement especially prior to 1965, 66, we'll say, was focused on individual rights for black people and the securing of political equality and legal rights and equality of opportunity. Things that were <clears throat> really very uncontroversial, right? You know, And so it wasn't that hard. I mean, it was obviously very hard. It was a horrible struggle that they had to do. But, you know, all you had to do is get, you know, most white people to think about the, the idea for a little bit and they would support it. So <clears throat> by 1965 and six, that, that battle has been won, that battle in the hearts and minds of uh, you know, white northerners, for instance, has been won. They support the civil rights movement in, in large numbers. Okay, it doesn't, <clears throat> okay so, that, so there's that. But the transition comes when in 1966 and seven, you have radicals calling for special entitlements for groups of people who have been victimized or marginalized. And what they're looking for is not just um, political and legal equality, but um, entitlements that will establish social and economic equality for those groups, okay? And that's what's going to be a much more difficult sell. Radicals are going to find a lot of opposition to this. And the opposition that they find is going to be um, causing them to become more um, <clears throat> assertive <laughs> in their movements. Okay, And that's going to cause backlash. So the polarization and the fragmentation of America into these two very polarized politically, uh, political opposite camps, radical and conservative, uh, that really starts to go, get underway in, in 1966 and 7. We're going to really focus on two of the movements, uh, the rise of uh, the Black Power Movement within the Civil Rights Movement and its eclipse of um, sort of the institutions uh, that were leading the Civil Rights Movement, though the Black Power Movement did not necessarily represent the majority of black people in America, what they wanted or what they were <clears throat> looking for, it did come to control the institution central to the civil rights movement and to eclipse Martin Luther King Jr.'s leadership, uh, ultimately. Um, <clears throat> well, we'll get into that tomorrow. But, uh, okay, so, so that'll be, <clears throat> we'll do that second, and we'll, but first we're going to talk about the women's movement, okay? Now, there were other movements going on. Notably, the farm workers movement, which was kind of the foundation for a movement for um, um, <clears throat> Latino people to organize and to um, demand recognition and, and equality and so forth. OK, um, <clears throat> and that was a fairly effective movement under the uh, leadership of a guy named Cesar Chavez out in California. OK, and um, we could have a whole lesson on that. But unfortunately, you know, 
you know, we don't have time. It's it's a good, but um, <clears throat> but essentially, uh, we're going to focus. We're going to focus on the women's movement and the Black Power movement because they were the biggest uh, at, in the late 1960s and had the biggest political impact. Okay, all right. So, what is the women's movement? All right. Well, first of all, um, <clears throat> let me think about how I'm going to do this. So, first of all, if if some liberal gets a hold of this and they see me talking about the women's movement or the Black Power movement, they're going to say this is. He can't talk about it because he's white. This is foundational to the, uh, the to the ideologies that were being developed in the late 1960s. Okay, well, <clears throat> okay, well, I'm your teacher, so I gotta talk about it. Okay, so uh, so here we go. Um, <clears throat> now, the women's movement we would kind of trace to Betty Friedan's book, The Feminine Mystique, and in the book, I think it comes out in like 62 or something. I don't know. Uh, she argues that <clears throat> being a housewife is like being trapped in a comfortable concentration camp. You're a prisoner. You are oppressed. You are uh, you're a you're in, you're in a, <clears throat> you're in a concentration camp. Okay. Now the the extreme language, you know, is meant to be startling. Okay. And um, <clears throat> the first thing to note about this is that this was not like this this had an appeal. Like a lot of women found this argument appealing. But a lot didn't. A lot found it really off-putting because they were content being housewives. So the first thing to say about Ferdinand is that she didn't represent all women, and her interpretation of being a housewife does not represent all women. Okay, so so what's going on here? Okay, well look, I'm not married. Okay, but what from what I've seen with my own mother and from my friends' wives, being a housewife is really hard. Not only is it really hard because you have to do all the tasks to keep the household going, but you also have to give up your own personal like career goals in order to do it. And some women do it really happily, they don't mind. Others have a really hard time giving up their professional life because they're ambitious and so on. And that's a huge sacrifice, a huge sacrifice. And for Dan was like, I think one of these uh, types of women who had hoped to have a professional career. And instead, I guess she had been yeah, and, and instead had become a housewife, and she was dissatisfied with it, right? And it's important to note that that's a huge sacrifice for a lot of women, giving that up, okay? And <clears throat> the second element of it is this. Like, um, I think she's focused on an idea of marriage that's... The, 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 the idea is if you're not personally fulfilled in it, if it's not personally satisfying to you, then it's a failure. Well, I think that's kind of the wrong idea of marriage. Marriage is actually is about sacrifice, okay? So... But the problem is that if one member of the marriage is doing all the sacrifice, that's a problem, okay? But the members, the, the husband and the wife need to, to, it's all about self-sacrifice for each other, right? To make each other the focus and each other's happiness and each other's well-being and spiritual health and so forth. And then that collective sacrifice for the children, okay? So it, if one if one person is carrying the burden of the sacrifice, <laughs> there's going to probably be resentment, right? Like that's, so I think that keep, keeping that in mind, right? And also, like, um, <clears throat> look, the husband needs to be, I mean, the whole thing is sacrifice. Like, look, it, a guy doesn't go into college and major in accounting because he loves it, probably. It's because he wants to eventually use it as a stable career. A, a guy doesn't stay working 12-hour days in an accounting firm because it's fun. No, it's because it's, he wants to provide that for the. So it needs to be sacrifice on both ends for it to work, okay? And in that sacrifice, there can then be deeper fulfillment and deeper happiness than one can find simply by pursuing one's own goals and dreams and in and, and that way. So <clears throat> I started out by saying focus on personal fulfillment is not the way to think about marriage. And maybe it is really because it's, but it's through sacrifice to the other and service to the other that you do find that personal deeper fulfillment. Okay, this has gone on way too long. So I'm gonna make this an, <laughs> this an optional one uh, well, no, maybe it's not. Maybe you really need to hear it. And then we'll go on with the uh, <clears throat> with the whole thing in the next lecture here. Okay.